And to the fans out there, I hope you've enjoyed the pictures uh, that I've been sharing, pictures that I've taken from the set of... Can, can we even say the name of the movie? You're gonna, you're gonna hand them a business card that says, I'm the director. Bitch. That's what I want for you. There wasn't a person paying attention who wasn't shocked when directors Phil Lord and Chris Miller were fired by Disney and Lucasfilm four months into shooting the upcoming Star Wars spin-off, Solo. Directors, of course, get fired in part ways during the early stages of pre-production and development all the time, but this seemed far different. An utterly unprecedented move, least of which because it would undeniably result in a massive PR hit to the film itself and to Lucasfilm president slash producer Kathleen Kennedy. But I don't really want to get into the messiness of what may or may not have happened on set, and whether or not Lord and Miller's firing was justified, because we'll never really know the answer to either of those questions. What we know, obviously, is that in the months since the duo's firing, Ron Howard was brought on board as their replacement to guide the film through its last few weeks of shooting and through all of post-production. And that leads us right to the thing I want to talk about. Really? Despite having worked in the film for two years, which included guiding it through the entirety of pre-production and more importantly for directing roughly 75% of principal photography, Lord and Miller announced in March of this year that they would simply be credited as executive producers, and nothing else. It's no doubt a head-scratching move, but despite what you may think, a decision like this, crediting Ron Howard as the sole director, doesn't really have all that much to do with Lucasfilm or with Disney or with Kathleen Kennedy or Lord and Miller or anyone else, and everything to do with these guys, the Directors Guild. This is the basic agreement that every member and every participating studio agrees to and are required to follow. The point being to define and protect the director's significant creative rights throughout the entire filmmaking process. Let's look at what's written about post-production. Section 7-202. Subject to other specific provisions hereof, between the time the director is employed and until the time he or she delivers the director's cut, he or she shall be informed as soon as practicable of any proposal. In no case will any creative decision be made regarding the preparation, production, and post-production of a motion picture without the consultation of the director. Section 7-508. It is understood and agreed that the director's right to prepare his or her director's cut is an absolute right subject to the terms and conditions of this basic agreement. Section 7-504. No one shall be allowed to interfere with the director of the film during the period of the director's cut. Section 7-506. The director shall have the right subject only to his or her availability to be present at all times and to consult with the employer throughout the entire post-production period in connection with the picture. The director must be notified of the date, time, and place of each post-production operation. However, all of that is contingent upon this. Section 7-503. A director who is replaced after directing 90% but less than 100% of the scheduled principal photography of any motion picture shall be the director of the film entitled to all the post-production creative rights set forth in this Article 7. And therein lies the punchline. Best estimates are that Lord and Miller only shot about 75% of Solo, therefore according to this rule they could be fired and not at all guaranteed any of those post-production creative rights nor the credit of directors as they hadn't yet crossed that 90% threshold. It may seem wrong or just simply unfair, but by all accounts there was never any legal obligation to credit them alongside Howard. From the moment he was hired it was always going to be a film directed by Ron Howard. Now, obviously that explains why Lord and Miller were never going to be credited, but it doesn't quite explain how Howard automatically received the credit, since there's no possible way he himself shot over 90% of principal photography. Unfortunately, the rules and guidelines concerning situations like these aren't really spelled out, although it's highly likely that Howard was considered in the eyes of the DGA as a substituting director, and therefore, according to Section 7-503, was only required to direct just over 10% of principal photography to be considered the sole director and thus be guaranteed credit and all post-production creative rights. The same thing goes for the upcoming Freddie Mercury biopic Bohemian Rhapsody, whose original director Brian Singer was fired last December after three months of production and replaced by Dexter Fletcher. By all accounts, Singer didn't hit that 90% mark, so despite the fact that the final credits are not yet official, there's not really much of a reason to think that when the film comes out this November, it won't simply just read, directed by Dexter Fletcher. Booyah. Unless you think otherwise, credit rulings like these aren't a question of whoever is the one to finish the job of directing a particular film. That's why Zack Snyder was only ever going to be the sole director credited for last year's Justice League, despite Joss Whedon being brought aboard to write additional scenes and to direct two months of reshoots. Snyder himself directed 100% of principal photography, and as per the DGA's rules, a director who shoots 100% may only be replaced and thereby forfeiting the credit for gross willful misconduct. And in a roundabout way, that leads us right back to Star Wars. May the Force be with us. Because that was very nearly the same situation that happened with Rogue One. 
The details are still somewhat vague, but what's been gathered is that director Gareth Edwards shot 100% of the film, but when Lucasfilm saw his cut, they panicked and brought on Tony Gilroy to oversee extensive rewrites and reshoots. But again, per the DGA's rules, Disney and Lucasfilm were required to include Edwards in the entire post-production process and credit him as the sole director. And knowing that, I think it makes complete sense why Lord and Miller were fired when they were. Think about it from Kathleen Kennedy's perspective. We know for a fact that Solo's production was going poorly and that the directing duo were constantly clashing with her and co-writer Lawrence Kasdan. And if they were allowed to direct much more, they would very soon cross that 90% threshold and thus be guaranteed not just the right to assembling the director's cut with no studio interference, but to be present and consulted for every single decision made throughout the entirety of post-production. Now, with Gareth Edwards, that may not have been as big of a deal, but because Kennedy had been fighting so much with Lord and Miller, it's likely that the year of post-production they were headed towards would have been just as fraught with constant trouble. And it's also less likely that the duo would have responded well to someone like Tony Gilroy being brought in to basically ghost direct while they have to just stand around and watch. Maybe an unprecedented move, but that is in all likelihood why they were fired when they were. Kathleen Kennedy was basically presented with two bad choices, a crappy post-production period that, lest we forget, may have very well resulted in a bad film, or bad PR. Whether or not it was the right choice remains to be seen, and that may very well just end up as a question that's never answered. I'll tell you this, though. There's no way that the behind-the-scenes features will look anything like this. I don't think, seriously, I have ever had an experience like I've had with this guy and this guy. They are the best, and you guys know that. You know that you are very, very lucky to have been led by this team. So I'm gonna let them speak to that. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in learning more about filmmaking techniques, you can check out this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with more than 18,000 classes available, covering animation, graphic design, photography, film production, and so much more. And with a premium membership, you can get unlimited access to incredibly high-quality classes, all taught by experts working in their respective fields for all less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. Every corner of filmmaking, whether it be animation, or editing, or screenwriting, or directing, requires both constant practice and constant learning. And Skillshare is without a doubt one of the best platforms to help you improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. And right now, the first 500 people to sign up get their first two months completely free. Go to skl.sh royalocean2 to sign up today. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.